Edo Arctic 2, Polar Research for Education, innovative program in Poland and Norway. Webinars. Welcome everyone. We're having a new Edo Arctic 2 uh, webinar today about the mysterious snow chicken. My name is Gabi Wagner. I'm a zoologist and I work at NIBIO, the Norwegian Institute for Bioeconomic Research. And um, I have uh, previously worked a lot with the snow chickens, so I'm going to tell you a bit about them. I will uh, start sharing my screen. Um, it, I'm not sure, is that visible now? Um, I think there's something wrong. Uh, let me try. So this is a track in the snow from the mysterious, well, what is it? Is it a six-legged alligator or is it the snow chicken or maybe a hybrid of those? And this track, of course, is made by a bird, a bird that lives in the snow. And it looks very much like a chicken as one in the shadows. And when we turn on the light, this is what they look like. We're going to talk today about the Svalbard rock ptarmigan the most northern herbivore bird, so that means they uh, eat plants and they live in the Arctic, which is amazing because there aren't all that many plants in the Arctic. The zoologists give every uh, species, uh, every animal species, a double name. Lagopus is the genus, Muta is the species, and Hyperborea is the subspecies that defines the rock ptarmigan that lives on Svalbard. And this is what they look like. In this picture, we have a beautiful male. And uh, already from this picture, we can already say a few things about the bird. This one, for example, I can tell is a male and he, it's the breeding season. So this picture was taken in spring and he's got these huge red eyebrows that swell up in the spring and that make him look very attractive to the ladies. And I can also tell he's a male even when the eyebrows are not swollen because the males have got this black um, eye mask over their face from the beaks. They have a fairly short beak, very strong, and um, this eye mask. So I can tell this is a male and the picture was taken in spring and we can already see the snow is starting to melt a bit and patches of the rocks are already visible. If we're looking at the female, this is one that would probably have been taken a few weeks previously because this female is already, uh, is still white at the time when the males start to defend their territories and getting ready for breeding season, the females have already changed into uh, their brown plumage. I will show you a picture of that shortly. So this is a female and you can immediately see she doesn't have that black eye patch. Um, she's a, a little bit smaller. Let's uh, analyze the name because the name already tells us quite a lot about the ptarmigan. The first word, lagopus, means the hare-footed one and for a comparison, Wait, I'm just trying, sorry, to get my laser pointer again. Here, yeah. So this is the foot of a uh, hare and it's very heavily furred. It's quite wide so that they can uh, tread lightly on loose snow. And this is the ptarmigan foot. And you can see it almost looks like uh, a mammal foot. So it looks like they've got fur on their feet. These are, of course, feathers. Uh, but they provide the same effect uh, for warmth and for spreading out the weight as we have in a mammal, in, in this case, the hair. I've also brought you one. I hope you can see that. This is the foot of a Svalbard ptarmigan. They've got fairly strong claws. And I hope you can see that. Really long, strong claws. And the whole foot looks like it's got fur on, even though this comes from a bird. So when you just find them in nature like this, it's it's not so easy to say if it comes from a bird or from a mammal. So the ptarmigan foot uh, increases the surface of the foot, makes it easier for the ptarmigan to walk on loose snow. And that means it reduces how much they sink into the snow. And that, of course, is very important energy adaptation, because if you sink in the snow with every step you make, you use a lot of energy just to uh, walk around. And the ptarmigan can really sort of almost float 
on the snow and that saves them a lot of energy in winter and they can actually walk a long way. And indeed the Svalbard ptarmigan don't particularly like to fly and we'll get round to why uh, very soon. So this bird actually mostly walks around in Svalbard and uh, that is mostly because they get very fat. So we'll learn a bit about that later. Um, so Lagopus, the first part of the name, the genus name means hair footed. Um, the second one, Muta, means uh, the changeable or the changing hair footed bird. And you can see that in winter, the bird is white. How many ptarmigan are in this picture? You may think it's one, but there are actually two more down here. So they're superbly camouflaged and they're almost impossible to spot on snow unless they start moving around. And especially in the males, you can see the black eye patch moving around on the snow. And in summer and autumn, they turn brown and they look perfectly like pieces of rock with lichen and moss on them. So again, in summer, they're pretty much impossible to spot. So this is what the species name for the um, ptarmigan means. Lagopus muta is the changing hair footed one. And then here we have an example of a mistimed a uh, male, this is a male that has turned white, um, it's, it's still white, but because uh, of climate change, the snow has already melted and that's a big problem for these birds because suddenly they are visible where they actually should be camouflaged. So climate change is a big problem for them because they're, the timing of their mold, the time at which they change their feathers, um, is shaped by evolution and the environment is now changing much faster than their genes. So very often the birds end up with the wrong plumage, their feathers look wrong, they don't camouflage them anymore. So that is one big problem the ptarmigan are having at the moment. The third name, the subspecies name, Hyperborea, uh, means above the tree line. The boreal line is pretty much the line that determines where, tree, where there are no more trees, so where you're really in the Arctic climate zone. And the boreal line is sort of going along here and fairly far down here in Northern America, Greenland, and Iceland has sort of got a little bit of trees developing recently with climate change. but. Norway is still well within the below the boreal line. But the Svalbard ptarmigan come from this archipelago. And we have a bigger map of that here. These are many, many islands uh, called uh, Spitzbergen or Svalbard. And this is where the Svalbard ptarmigan is. And it, it is very different from the ptarmigan that we see in uh, uh, circumpolar countries and also different from the ptarmigan that we see on little leftovers in the Alps and the Pyrenees. The Svalbard ptarmigan is a uh, main thing really a lot bigger than all the other ptarmigan um, in the world. So hyperborea means above the tree line, above the forests and that pretty much describes what Svalbard looks like. There are no trees on Svalbard and this is perfect country for ptarmigan. This is what they uh, live on. So this is what Svalbard looks like in summer. In winter, there isn't much to see because it's mostly dark and everything is covered in snow and ice. But uh, in summer, it's a very rich area for animals that can cope with Arctic conditions. A lot of dwarf plants, the ptarmigan in particular love blueberries, dwarf birches and dwarf willows. Alpine bistort is really important for the chicks when they grow up because it contains a lot of protein. Um, the crowberries are very important to them and especially in spring, many of these plants, um, even when they're not having berries, they have a lot of vitamin C and they need loads of that to grow into healthy chicks. So Svalbard is, even though there are no forests and there is no big vege vegetation, not real shrubs or forests, it's very rich country for the ptarmigan. So they're doing really well there. This is what Svalbard looks like in uh, winter. 
uh, this picture is taken in spring already because in winter it's dark and you can't really take pictures then. So the snow is already starting to melt, the ice in the fjords is starting to melt. And if you look at that, you really have to ask yourself, how can an animal that lives on plants survive a winter with seven months under snow and ice in an area like this? How does this work? And uh, the answer is in the body weight of the ptarmigan. I already said the ptarmig Svalbard ptarmigan is the biggest of all the ptarmigans and they have invested heavily into a big body. So the one thing they can do is get really, really fat. In winter, they eat so much that they uh, get very fat. Uh, I've had males with half a kilo weight, so they're really big birds. And, um, and they use the fat they store in their body to, uh, they use the reserves in the fat to make it through the winter. So they actually live off their own body fat. Sorry, I was saying the males, they get up to a kilo. So really a heavy bird. Um, so they don't hibernate, they're active all winter. They walk around, they sometimes when forced fly around. So they're not hibernating, but they do live off their fat reserves mostly. And um, let's have a look at this graph because it's really interesting and maybe a bit counterintuitive. We have here on the x-axis, this is the year from December through the summer to winter again. And here in grey, this is the time of the year when it's dark. So that's Arctic winter when the sun does not rise. And then we have a few uh, weeks of uh, day and night. And then the Arctic summer starts again in March and the sun does not set. So it's light all day round. And this is the time that the ptarmigan really wait for. This is when they have their young ones when they eat. Now, the interesting thing is that in summer, when there is a lot of food available, the ptarmigan actually drop in weight. So even though they eat loads, this is the upper line here, their food intake goes massively up. They eat all the time, 24 hours. They're very active. They eat loads and loads, but they get thinner and thinner and thinner. So in summer, they're really lean. They have their beach body. But then in uh, autumn, something changes and that's really very much a switch in their brain um, and they suddenly start to gain weight and you can see that happens at the time when the food is becoming sparse again and it's not just how much food there is available it's also defined by their own appetite so they're also losing appetite so while their food intake goes down their body weight is going up so the body is changing um, how it deals with the calories the bird is taking in. You would also see that at this time, the birds become less active. So they're not flying around very much. And they really switch to walking only and they're gaining fat very fast. So and you can see this is a, uh, I'm sure that was a male. So that's sitting at almost a kilo in weight. That's a very big ptarmigan. And then, of course, there comes the point when there is no more food available, when everything is covered in snow and ice, and then their body weight really starts to go down again. And then we're back in the new year. So this is amazing. So their body weight is not dependent on the available food because we can see in summer they eat lots, but they're actually losing weight. They're very lean, whereas the scarcer the food gets, the fatter they get. So this is completely regulated by the brain and it would of course be fantastic if we knew how this works because that could really be help for people who are battling with obesity. So it's all happening in the brain. But it's not entirely true that there is no food at all in winter. There is of course still vegetation under the snow and that is where the really big claws of the ptarmigan come in which I showed you previously. They're really good at digging. So especially on Svalbard where it's very cold and there isn't actually a lot of snow, but it's very light snow. There's very little precipitation in the Arctic. So in this light fluffy snow, the ptarmigan can dig down and uh, scratch through the snow uh, in order to find food. So even if there is a layer of snow, the ptarmigan 
just like the reindeer too, can actually dig down and still find green food and plants down there. So um, that's one thing they can do. The other thing is, of course, uh, they are superbly insulated. They have a lot of fat on their body in winter, that insulates, that keeps them warm. They have superb plumage, so their feathers are a fantastic insulator. It's actually really difficult, even with an infrared sensor, to find ptarmigan in snow because they they don't lose any heat. They're so superbly insulated. And then if on top of that, they're also digging into the snow and sitting in these snow caves and they just let themselves snow in so you can see a perfectly undisturbed snow cover, but there might actually be ptarmigan underneath them. Um, and that too protects them from heavy storms, from the wind, and they can actually keep cool, uh, keep warm enough in the snow. So they are really good at saving energy. And that's also the reason why they don't fly in winter. It's much better for them to not be exposed to the wind, uh, to be in the snow and to sit quietly. And this is also what we see when we keep them in captivity. Even if they have a lot of food, they're not going to eat. They're not going to be active, they just sit. So they're sitting out the winter pretty much, but they're awake, so it's not a hibernation. Um, and you can see in this picture, it's really nice dry snow in the Arctic, but that is something that is changing with climate change. So the winters are getting much wetter now, and uh, that means the snow is getting wetter, and that of course, drags away a lot of heat from the ptarmigan. They can't uh, really let themselves snow in in that anymore because they would get wet and that would mean they lose a lot of heat from their body. Um, and it also means that they can't dig down to the ground anymore because wet, heavy snow is not something they can dig up that will cost them way too much energy. So wet snow is really bad news for them. The ptarmigan have a few predators on Svalbard. The main predator is the geofalken, which is a superb predatory bird that mostly focuses really on males, especially in spring when the falcons have chicks, they really target the, the males that are still white and show up on the brown ground. So in spring, the gear falcon pretty much exclusively lives of males, ptarmigan males that are trying to defend their territory and are very visible. Uh, but of course, throughout the summer, they will also take the chicks and the females. Um, very successful bird that can uh, live almost exclusively on ptarmigan on Iceland, for example. Another one, of course, is the Arctic fox, um, which is also uh, changing its fur in winter, almost invisible in its white, thick winter fur in summer, nice and brown. So they will hunt ptarmigan uh, year round and they're very good at finding them. Then of course there is a hunt, humans are hunting ptarmigan and um, that's happening all around the world, not just on Svalbard. And, uh, is likely to be a problem in future because ptarmigan populations worldwide are going down very fast. And then there are some um, other competitors. So one effect of climate change is the summers are longer now and that means there is more vegetation available and that means new species are doing uh, really well. So the pink-footed geese, for example, they have been on Svalbard all along, but the populations of geese are growing massively because suddenly there's much more food, much more vegetation available for them in the Arctic. So the goose populations, are not just the pink-footed one, but also other geese are doing really well at the moment. And that means there are a lot of birds suddenly that also eat the grass, not just the ptarmigan. And a goose is a big bird. So they, they're about, yeah, they're a big bird and they eat about a sort of shopping bag full of grass every day. So they're putting away a fair amount of food and they're plainly competing with the ptarmigan. So even though they're not hunting them, of course, 
they are competitors and the ptarmigan are finding it and and also actually the svalbard reindeer uh, are competing with the, these uh, fast growing goose populations for the food and uh, that is a, a big change in the arctic uh, ecosystem at the moment Another big problem uh, of climate change is something that is called ROS, that means rain on snow event. I already mentioned that um, the Arctic winters are becoming much more wet, there is more precipitation and more and more the temperatures are hovering around the zero degree zone where they previously were sitting at minus eight minus five degrees temperatures the rate of temperature change is much higher in the arctic so while the global climate um, agreements are talking about an increase of world temperatures of two to three degrees that's nothing to what is happening in the arctic so um, even here in northern Norway, we're likely talking about 8 to 10 degrees. And that's, of course, a huge difference for the ground because at minus 8 degrees, the ground is frozen solid, whereas at zero degrees, it's melting. And that also makes a big difference for uh, the precipitation. If you have the sea covered uh, with ice and it'll be cold, and the water will be bound but if there is a lot of open sea ice uh, sorry a lot of open sea not covered by ice that means there is more humidity in the air and that has to come down at one point and if it's not below freezing point it will come down as rain so what we're seeing increasingly is that brown that is already frozen is getting rained on and then it gets cold again and then this water can't go anywhere because the ground can't take it up. The, the deeper areas of the ground are still frozen. So the whole thing freezes and you've got a huge ice rink, such as you see here. And then it may snow on top of that again. Or it may just snow, uh, it may just rain onto the snow. And that means the, the, the top surface of the snow is uh, melting and then it's freezing again. So you have a layer of ice sitting on top of the snow and that can happen many times uh, so we had uh, two winters ago in northern Norway we had up to seven layers of ice sitting in the snow layer and that's a massive problem for the animals because arctic animals are have evolved to deal with um, dry snow and the snow layer they can just dig through and find the grass uh, and plants growing still underneath. So even in winter, you can find green plants under the snow. But that is now locked off by a layer or several layers of ice. So if you're looking at this uh, snow layer, for example, you've got nice fluffy Arctic snow here. Down here it gets a bit wet. And here at the bottom, you just have this solid layer of 20 centimeters of pure ice no animal can dig through that and that means that the whole vegetation is not available anymore that's a problem for the ptarmigan because even though they have these very strong claws there's no way they can dig their way through 20 centimeters of ice and the same is true for the reindeer so rain and snow events are really killer events for arctic animals and unfortunately, we're seeing that a lot in the north now, not just on Svalbard, but also um, on the continent. This is what plants look like when they're being rained on. So usually in winter, the ptarmigan would feed on such a green sprout here. But if it's covered in ice, they can't access it. They don't find it. And even if they do find it and do try to eat it, they would, their body warmth would first have to melt the ice in their body and that would cost them a lot of energy. So even if they would eat that and could have access to the calories in this plant, they would use more energy to melt the plant. They would lose so much heat through that, that it, it's not paying off to eat those plants. So 
several uh, really bad things happening there with the rain on snow events. Let's summarize a bit um, how climate change is challenging uh, animals that have evolved for 10,000s of years to cope with an Arctic climate. So one or several of the climate changes we're facing are we have the most rapid climate warming on Earth at the moment. It's nothing like anything we've seen before. I think we can all agree on that now. That means we have shorter winters. We have wetter winters because the sea ice isn't there anymore. There's more humidity in the air and that means there is more snow. The snow is heavier and it can come down as rain onto the snow or on the frozen ground. And we have these locked pastures. We have warmer summers, which uh, might be considered a good thing. So there are more plants around, but it also means that uh, Plants that haven't been there before can suddenly grow in the Arctic or can do better. So dwarf plants uh, are being outcompeted by bigger plants, by bigger shrubs. And there's a forestification, not on Svalbard yet, but we can definitely see that here in northern Norway, the forest is taking over where before there were just shrubs and, um, and taiga and tundra areas. So the whole vegetation is changing and all the little dwarf plants and all the berries are competing suddenly with completely different plants than they have been the last few ten thousands of years. That also means uh, because it's warmer there are more insects, there are more bacteria, there are more viruses, more animals, for example the geese are coming so plainly the number of animals of single species that are doing well can increase and that means there are also more parasites around and there are more infectious diseases and more animals that can actually spread infections and especially for Svalbard animals on Svalbard this is really bad news because Svalbard has been basically um, insect parasite infectious disease free for forever and the animals there have a really bad immune system because they live in the Arctic. They just didn't have to cope with infectious diseases or parasites before. Whereas now all of those are blooming up and uh, being carried in every spring with all the geese populations, for example. So the animals on Svalbard suddenly have to face immune challenges they haven't had to deal with before and they're not, their immune system is not equipped to deal with that. There's also the North is uh, very interesting to a lot of industrial sectors. Uh, there's mining going on, wind farms, tourism in the Arctic is a real hype. Um, and that means there's a lot more disturbance and the habitats of the animals are being more and more fragmented, more roads are being built, more human activity all around. And that means a disturbance. And that is also something that Arctic animals um, don't necessarily cope with well. So on the one hand, there is a mainly the the area that is uh, destroyed. For example, if you build a mine or a wind farm, but then there are also the disturbances that are associated with that. So people are building things there in order to be busy there. So there will be traffic. There will be people moving around. There will be snow scooters. Um, so that disturbance comes on top of the actual destruction of area for the animals. So there's a lot of uh, things happening that Arctic animals uh, didn't have to deal with uh, the last 10,000 years and before. So one thing we've already seen is we're getting timing mismatches. Um, the animals have evolved to change their fur, their feathers at a certain time of year. But suddenly that is not the appropriate time anymore because it's warmer, uh, the snow melts earlier, the plants appear earlier. And if you're still stuck with your white plumage, then it's very likely that you're being eaten by a, a falcon or a fox because it's very easy to spot the animals. The other thing is for the same reasons, the plants are growing earlier. And that means uh, the timing of the birth of the chicks, for example, 
does not fit with the environment anymore. So all the plants that the chicks rely on, for example, this alpine bistort that I showed you at the beginning, they are suddenly growing and they're ripe to be eaten much earlier before the chicks are born or before the chicks are ready to eat them. So even though those plants are there and doing well, the ptarmigan can't use them anymore because they appear at the wrong time because the ptarmigan can't control when it has its chicks. So this is called a timing mismatch. And we see that for the food, of course, we see that for the timing of the fattening or the losing flat fat, the timing of territoriality, um, the food that is available to them. So all of these are really bad news when the environment is changing fast, but the genes of the ptarmigan are not. So the climate is the climate change is outrunning the evolution. Then, of course, there's new predation and new predators, for example, the pink footed goose, more disturbance through hunting, um, growing populations of foxes, for example, new competition, we've said. Um, and then when the snow is wet, we talked about that too. That means there is no food or shelter available. So on the one hand, when we have rain on snow events, the vegetation that is there is not accessible anymore for the ptarmigan because it's covered by ice. The other one is the wet snow does not protect them anymore. Ptarmigan, in order to sit in a snow uh, cave or in a snow hole, the ptarmigan need nice, dry, fluffy snow. But if the snow is wet, it's no use to them, quite on, to the contrary, it's dangerous for them to sit in wet snow because once they get wet, their feathers don't work anymore and they lose heat very fast. And then their fat reserves, of course, will not last through the winter anymore. Um, even though the vegetation might actually do really well, new plants, more plants, plants growing longer, the food that is really important to the ptarmigan is not there when they need it anymore. So the ptarmigan is equipped to deal with certain plants appearing at a certain time. If that doesn't happen anymore, then their whole habitat is uh, very of questionable quality for them. So more plants does not necessarily mean it's better for the ptarmigan because they are very specialized birds that need certain plants at a certain time of the year. And if that time is changing, we have again a timing mismatch. And then, of course, there is plainly stress from diseases, from parasites, number of insects and human activities, of course. So there's a lot uh, the ptarmigan have to deal with. And the more we understand these pressures on the ptarmigan, the better chance we have to protect them in the future. That's it from me. I hope uh, you learned a little bit. For those who are interested, we have a Kahoot quiz that's available from EduArctic2. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Watch other recordings from webinars on our YouTube channel youtube.com slash edoarctic edoarctic2 from polar research to scientific passion innovative nature education in poland and norway receives a grant of 240,000 euros received from iceland Liechtenstein, and norway under eea funds